In the beginning, God, the love of our souls, the source of goodness, truth, and justice, a perfect kingdom of love and light. Until war broke out in heaven through one fallen angel who broke God's perfect law, Lucifer coveted God's throne and authority and deceived one third of the angels to rebel against the Holy One. Since that time, Earth is a war zone where the forces of light and darkness, good and evil, truth and deceit battle it out in a life or death conflict. Are you just a spectator or have you taken sides? Are you living the victorious life God intended for you to have? Let Marla Alona guide you through the truth of God's word that you may choose right, that you may have life and have it more abundantly, and that God's truth may bring you eternal life. Welcome to Setting the Record Straight, God's Truth for This Generation. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. In our last study, we worked through how to pull down enemy strongholds that keep us stuck in patterns of sin. We said that the Lord has given us many promises and very specific weaponry we can use to destroy those strongholds, those footholds that the enemy has gained in our lives. Uprooting strongholds is like peeling off layers of sinfulness and bad character traits. If you haven't listened to that study, I highly recommend that when you finish this one that you go back and listen to that study because these two topics are very connected. Today, we're going to finish off that conversation about strongholds by focusing on the process of sanctification. You're probably thinking, sanctification? Why is that an interesting topic? Why are we talking about sanctification? Isn't it good enough to be saved? Why do I have to be sanctified? I'll never make it. That's not for me. Well, those are very good questions. Listen to what the Bible says. Well, first, let me give you the net net. The net net is, the Bible says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. That in and of itself is a powerful enough reason to be interested in the topic of sanctification. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Now, let's look at some other scriptures, which are all going to confirm that and say that in slightly different ways. Listen to Revelation 21, verse 27, speaking of the holy city, the new Jerusalem, the holy city of God. But there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. We have a second witness in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11, where the Apostle Paul says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And last but not least, I'm going to give you a third witness. The Lord Jesus himself said in the Beatitudes, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's Matthew 5, verse 8. The paradox of this generation is that we're the most sinful generation that ever lived, even worse than the generation of the flood. But we will have the awesome privilege of seeing the Lord Jesus come in the clouds of glory. Now, when we see Jesus come, we want to run toward him, not run away from him. And so if we want to be taken up by the angels to meet Jesus in the air, then we need to be sanctified so that he can take us back home with him. Well, how do we become sanctified? How does that work? What is the process? That is exactly what we're going to dive into right now. This is a beautiful study, so please make sure to stay with us until the very end. Let's get started. Sanctification is not optional. We just heard from the Word of God that nothing unclean, nothing impure, nothing sinful will enter heaven. Heaven is a perfect, undefiled, holy place without corruption of any kind. 
Therefore, it's absolutely mandatory that we come to grips with our own sinfulness and stop sinning. It's urgent, you heard me right, it's urgent, imperative that we stop sinning right now. There's a judgment going on in heaven at this very time. As I speak, names are being called in heaven. People are passing before God's judgment seat. Our names could be called at any time. We know not when. We won't appear in heaven personally for our judgment because we're here on earth. The judgment is taking place in heaven. But when our names are called, we'll be judged by the things written in the books. This is what the Bible says. What books? The books that the recording angels keep of all of our words and deeds. Remember when Jesus said, By your words you shall be justified, by your words you shall be condemned. So our words are taken into account in the judgment. Our deeds, of course, are taken into account. And the Father in heaven, of course, knows the heart. So that also, um, that also is part of the judgment. What were our motives and our intentions behind the actions? That also will be reviewed in heaven. Now, the good news in all of this is that Jesus is our judge and advocate. Hallelujah. We have, the Bible says, and if any man sin, he has an advocate in heaven, the man Christ Jesus. If we're in right standing with Jesus, he takes our place and imputes his perfect righteousness to us. Nevertheless, it's Jesus' desire to also impart to us his righteousness. Not only to impute to us his righteousness, but to impart to us his righteousness. So there are two kinds of righteousnesses. Imputed righteousness is the righteousness that Jesus credits to our account. It's his righteousness, it's his perfect life, but it's being credited to our account by faith. Imparted righteousness is the righteousness where Jesus helps us to acquire his perfect character so that we become like him. And that, and that is the condition of being holy. Now we need both, we need both types of righteousness to be admitted as citizens of heaven. There are three other things I'd like you to consider about sanctification. Number one, going back to the strongholds. If you get rid of sin, but don't replace it with something substantial, something um, um, tangible, like the active pursuit of holiness, the demons will come back. Let's read what Jesus said in Luke 11. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he passes through dry places seeking rest. And finding none, he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. Then he goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than himself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. Again, this is Luke 11, verses 24 through 26. We learn here that an empty house, even though it may be in order, is very inviting to evil spirits who come back to tempt and harass. So you need to fill your house, you need to fill your temple, your body temple, your mind temple, with diligent study of the Word of God, prayer, witnessing, and active service to the Lord. Otherwise, the demons will come back even worse. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, verse 14, Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. That was a scripture that we quoted earlier. So you have to be in active pursuit of holiness, and you have to fill your house, your temple, with the Spirit of God. Number two. Without a vision, the people perish. Proverbs 29, verse 18. Sanctification is the vision that God holds for each and every one of us. Let me share a quick story with you. Um, when I first got saved, I went to a Sunday church for about six months. And there I had a conversation with one of the prayer warriors who was, min who was ministering to me. And she said to me, I want for myself, what I pray for is the highest good that the Lord has for me. Not just something I'd like, not just something oh, that the Lord might have for me. I want the highest good that he has for me. And I thought that was extremely powerful. And I, I embrace that. The vision that God holds is much higher than our vision. 
It's higher than our ways. It's higher than our thoughts. It's higher than anything that we could come up with on our own. That vision that God holds for us, if we embrace that vision, it gives us a goal to strive for, and it gives us the inspiration to finish this race. This is not an easy race. If you want to make it to heaven, you're going to have to fight for it. All the demons of hell are going to be mobilized against you to prevent you from making it to heaven. You don't see them, but they're working day and night tirelessly. They don't sleep, setting all kinds of traps for you to cause you to fall and to sin. They want you to backslide. They want you to get distracted. They want you to do anything but study the word of God. So you have to keep your eyes on Jesus and not look back. I love this scripture by Paul. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14. Hallelujah. Number three, lastly, God's elect follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Jesus is in the most holy place right now. The most holy place contains the Ark of the Covenant, contains the rod of Aaron that budded almonds, it contains manna, and it also contains the golden censer, which normally is, in, is kept in the holy place, but on the Day of Atonement, on the Day of Judgment, it, it was brought into the most holy place to offer up prayers. Uh, for forgiveness of sin. So the most holy place is where Jesus is officiating on our behalf as high priest in this very moment to follow Jesus into the Holy of Holies, right? Which is the other name for the most holy place. The most holy place, the Holy of Holies, is the same chamber of the, of the sanctuary. It's the innermost chamber. To follow Jesus there requires holiness. That's where the throne of God is. That's where the law is of God is. And because that's where the law, that's where the seal of God is also dispensed in the end time. The seal of God is the opposite of the mark of the beast. So we need holiness to be admitted into the most holy place. We need holiness in order to be sealed. And why do we want to be sealed? Because the seal of God is our guarantee of protection during the great time of trouble when the last seven plagues of the wrath of God will fall upon the wicked and will fall upon those who rejected the truth. Those who bear the seal of God on their foreheads will receive divine protection. They will not be hurt by the plagues. The plagues will fall all around them. People will fall all around us like flies, but we will not be touched because on our foreheads is the seal of God. What is sanctification? In plain language, Sanctification is the process of making holy, the process of consecrating or dedicating something or someone to a holy purpose. Sanctification means to set aside or to set apart for a holy purpose. Another synonym is to hallow or to purify. For example, in the book of Exodus, in, uh, uh, specifically in Exodus 20 verse 11, the Lord told the children of Israel to worship him on the Sabbath day, which he had sanctified. And he told them that he had set aside that day because he had rested on that day. So let's read. Let's read from Exodus 20, verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So here we uh, read how the seventh day was set apart. It was hallowed. It was blessed. It received a special blessing that no other day of the week has. Let me give you another example. The vessels of the sanctuary were consecrated for the ministry of the Lord. In the book of Daniel chapter 5, when Nebuchadnezzar's grandson Belshazzar and his guests took the holy vessels of the temple to drink wine in the vessels, to um, praise and worship their gods. They were profaning 
the holy things of the temple. They were desecrating vessels that had been consecrated to the service of God. So desecrate is the opposite of consecrate, right? We consecrate something to a holy purpose. We desecrate it if we trample upon it, if we disregard the holiness of that object or of that day or of that person. So we read, therefore, again, back in the book of Daniel, chapter 5, that when Belshazzar and his guests drank from the holy vessels of God, the wrath of God fell upon them. And God pronounced judgment against Belshazzar that very moment. That's when the hand, remember the, the hand with the finger that writes on the wall, and it writes, um, you have been judged and found wanting, Today the kingdom shall be taken from you. So uh, it was Daniel, by the way, who interpreted the writing on the wall, which they could not interpret. They had called Daniel to interpret it. So anyway, we don't have time for the full story. It's a fascinating story. But uh, that very night, Babylon indeed was taken by Cyrus of Medo-Persia, King Cyrus. And this is all a demonstration that God takes sanctification extremely seriously. So Belshazzar brought this wrath of God upon himself. He brought this uh, devastation and tragedy and destruction upon himself because he desecrated the holy vessels of God's temple. You're listening to Setting the Record Straight, God's Truth for This Generation. Now, okay, so we've talked about a day, the Sabbath. We've talked about objects, the objects of the sanctuary. On a more personal level, what is sanctification? Sanctification is the opposite of sinfulness. There are sins of commission, where we do something wrong, and sins of omission, where we fail to do the right thing. Sanctification includes not doing wrong, not doing things that are wrong, not breaking God's law, and also doing that which is right, taking every opportunity proactively, taking every opportunity to do good, going the extra mile, doing the random acts of kindness, uh, being merciful to all, being patient, all those good things. So sanctification requires not doing that which is wrong, and also doing that which is right, proactively doing that which is right. This is why sanctification is an active process. It's not a passive thing. We'll see in a moment that it's God who sanctifies us. We can't sanctify ourselves. There's no way. But we do have to be active co-laborers with God. It's not something God does to us. Rather, it's something he does with us. With our active participation, we are co-laborers with him in the sanctification process, and we willfully surrender of our own free will, with our own freedom of choice, we surrender to him, we choose to surrender to him, we yield to him so that he may work in us and through us. And that's an absolute requirement for sanctification. So that leads me to the next point, which is that holiness means being under the control of God's Spirit. We need to yield to that Spirit. L listen to what it says in Second Peter 1, verse 21. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So these holy men allowed themselves to be moved by the Holy Spirit of God in order to prophesy and to speak the Word of God, or to write, as the case may be, the Word of God. So holiness means yielding control to God's Spirit, yielding our lives, and yielding control over our body, our mind, our heart, our tongues, our hands, just fully yielding to the Spirit of God. Now, there's an aspect of sanctification which is very, very spiritual, and then there are aspects that are more tied to our daily lives, right, to being, to something called practical godliness. So holy people, let me illustrate this, uh, character is something that we can see, right, character is very tangible, character is expressed through habits, behaviors, responses, verbal and nonverbal. So one thing that holy people do is they purify their character to become like Christ, 
Let's read from 1 Thessalonians 4. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. Okay, we have one more confirmation. The will of God for us, God's vision for us, is sanctification. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. In other words, not doing something wrong. That, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel, meaning his own body temple, in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Another aspect of this uh, practical godliness is lifestyle. Holy people live a simple, orderly lifestyle. Let's listen to Paul also in 1 Thessalonians 4. But we urge you, brethren, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands, as we commanded you, that you may walk properly toward those who are outside, and that you may lack nothing. So what is, that? What is Paul trying to say here? Holy men and women are not busybodies in the church or in their neighborhood or in their workplace. Holy men and women earn their own living with the work of their hands. They don't steal or beg or borrow or live off the work of others. So again, this is the practical godliness side of this. Another very specific end time aspect of sanctification is belief in the truth. Now I want you to listen up here very closely. This is very important. This is for us, the generation of the end. Let me give you two witnesses. John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So the Bible, the word of God is critical. It is absolutely crucial. And we'll see more scriptures to this point. Uh, scripture is indispensable to the sanctification process. Let me give you another scripture in 2 Thessalonians 2. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth, to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why is this so important, this aspect of belief in the truth and sanctification by the truth? for us as the end time generation. Those who end up taking the mark of the beast will take the mark of the beast because they have not received the love of the truth. Let me say that again. Those who end up taking the mark of the beast will not have in themselves the love of the truth. They will have rejected truth. They will have despised truth. And therefore, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. What lie? The lie of the counterfeit Christ that's coming. And therefore, because they did not receive the love of the truth, they will end up offering false worship to a false Christ. So they will end up offering Sunday worship to a counterfeit Christ. Let me read you the passage. It's in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 9 through 12. The coming of the lawless one, the lawless one is the Antichrist, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. This pleasure in unrighteousness is because they're going to conform to tradition or they're going to conform to what their pastor says or what their uh, relative says, but they have not developed the love of the truth to study the Bible for themselves, to study with godly uh, teachers of the word, godly men and women of God who are teaching truth and, um, and who are encouraging those who want to learn to study the Bible for themselves. That's why you must always um, listen to what I say and then go to the Bible and see for yourselves whether what I'm saying is true. So in the end time, back to um, this scripture here, 2 Thessalonians 2, in the end time, speaking the truth and loving the truth 
are going to be absolute requirements to make it into heaven. You will, if you don't study the Bible, if you don't understand prophecy, if you don't understand about the seal of God versus the mark of the beast and other important concepts for the end time, you're going to end up in the wrong place. Okay, now the last aspect of sanctification that we want to highlight in this segment is this. Sanctification is the ultimate purpose of the plan of redemption. Jesus paid the price for us on the cross. That work, that part of the work is finished, right? He said, it is finished, part one. But Jesus can't take us back with him to heaven unless we look like him. His image and likeness must be restored in us. God created us in his image and likeness. Sin has marred the image of God in us. Sin has blotted out the image of God in us. That needs to be restored. Listen to three scriptures that I want to give you here quickly. Matthew 5, 48. Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. We are to look like the Father. 1 Peter 1, 16. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. This is God speaking. We are to be holy because God is holy. And third witness, Leviticus 20, verse 26. And you shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and have separated you from the peoples, that you should be mine. So again, for I, the Lord, am holy. We are to be holy because God is holy, and because he has se separated us, he has called us to be separate from all the peoples of the earth, that we should be purely his people, distinct, peculiar, um, a unique, different people of God. That's who we're called to be. Sin, rebellion, disobedience, uh, straying, backsliding, all of that separated us from God and blotted out that perfect image in us. Sanctification and holiness, then, are the spiritual condition of being restored to the perfection of the character of Christ that perfect obedience, that perfect righteousness, that he may not only impute it to us on the books, but that we may live it out in our lives. That's the imparted righteousness. It's not only on the books as a transaction in the records of heaven that his righteousness and his perfect life was imputed to our account. No, it's the actual living out, having, possessing the righteousness of Christ, that we can be that righteousness in the world. And, and be be a witness to others. Your behavior, your holiness, your righteousness, the way you live your life, your lifestyle, your mannerisms, your, your, uh, your voice, how you speak, how you address others, all of that is speaking holiness or not. So you're a witness with everything that your very life is a witness to the glory of God or to the, to the shame, right, of his name. You either bring glory to God or you bring shame to his name. If you call yourself a Christian and you're not living a holy life, you're literally bringing dishonor to God's name. So a couple more things here. So let me read you this quote from Ellen G. White in Christ Object Lessons. She said, The sanctification of the soul by the working of the Holy Spirit is the implanting of Christ's nature in humanity. So this sums up very well what we've been saying. And we'll see in the next section that it is through the agency of the Holy Spirit that we become sanctified. So ultimately, another way of saying everything that we've been saying is to say that sanctification is perfect obedience to God's law and to all of his counsels. We read... Um, I just want to share this scripture with you, a couple of scriptures that I really like. Obedience, we read in the in uh, 1 John that, uh, you know, obedience to God's law is not burdensome. It's not grievous. God's law is not that heavy to keep. It's not that difficult, actually. If we are filled with the Holy Spirit, that gives us the strength to... In other words, yes, it's difficult. No, let me, let me take that back. It is difficult. It's not easy to live in a sinful world and to be perfectly holy. Of course, it's not easy. But we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And when we are filled with the Spirit, when we live Spirit-filled lives, it helps. It helps a lot, and it actually makes it easier. Not easy, but easier.
So sanctification is about obedience. And remember, the, the reward of obedience is blessing, right? Remember Deuteronomy 28, where God speaks of all the blessings that are bestowed upon those who obey in Isaiah. It's Isaiah 1. I forget the exact chapter in Isaiah. But the Bible says, the Lord says through Isaiah, If you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. So that represents all good things. We shall be blessed with all manner of blessing if we're obedient. If we, you know, restrain ourselves, exercise self-control, and not do that thing which we're tempted to do, the sin that so easily besets us, right? But if we control, exercise self-control, and discipline our mind by getting rid of those strongholds in the mind, if we do that, and we walk in perfect obedience. Oh, the blessings of heaven. Oh, we'll live under an open heaven. We will. The blessing of God will be upon us. Okay, let me skip here to our last scripture on this topic. I All the scriptures, I don't have time to go through each and every one of them, um, but uh, you'll find the full study notes on our website, citybiblegroup.com. So in addition to listening to the study, you can also read the study and pick up any scriptures that I may have had to skip for lack of time. So let's wrap up this section with um, uh, Revelation 14, verse 12, where we read about the end time saints of the Most High. So see, this is not just Old Testament teachings here. The New Testament, especially the book of Revelation, is filled with references to God's law and to obedience. So Let's read Revelation 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So keeping the commandments of God is not passe. It was not nailed to the cross. It is not an Old Testament requirement. This is for us living in the end time. Keeping the commandments of God is one of the defining characteristics of God's people in the end time. This verse in Revelation 14, 12 is, is describing God's elect, God's remnant people in the end time. So it's a defining characteristic to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. You're listening to Setting the Record Straight, God's Truth for This Generation. How do we become sanctified? Number one, the first thing to understand is that sanctification is a process and it takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. That's why it's so important to start now. Now, now. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. Redeem the time because the days are evil. All of the Bible is telling us to go for it now. Don't wait. Don't wait until your spouse makes up his mind or her mind. Don't wait until something dire happens. Um, do it now. Make the choice now. Number two, sanctification requires faith and trust. Trust in what? Trust in the Word of God that He will complete the good work that He has started in you. That's Philippians 1, 6. That is a beautiful promise in Philippians 1, 6. And we should all, by the way, we should all remind ourselves of this scripture more often. It says, being confident of this very thing, that he who started a good work in you shall carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I think that's new, that's the uh, King James Version, but whatever the version, uh, pick a good version, please. Pick a good Bible version, but, but in any event, let's move on. You have to believe all the good things that God says about you do not get discouraged. When you fall, don't get discouraged. A righteous man may fall seven times and rise again. Hallelujah. That's a promise in Proverbs twenty four sixteen. Let me give you three more promises. You're a new creation and all things concerning you have been made new. That's 2 Corinthians five seventeen. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. We already said that, Philippians 4.13. And you're more than a conqueror through him who loved you, Romans 8.37. So we have abundant Bible evidence that God is going to help us and that God is going to give us, God is going to give us the strength to do what we need to do 
and to be sanctified because it's going to take effort. It's, it's not an easy ride. God will give you the strength that you need and he will do his part. Number three, as we just said, it is God who sanctifies you. You can't sanctify yourself no matter how hard you try. It is impossible for you to sanctify yourself on your own. No matter how many good works you do, you cannot sanctify yourself. Only God can do that work in you, and he has promised to finish that good work in you. Your part is to yield to the Lord and to let him have his way in you. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God, and you shall keep my statutes and perform them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. That's Leviticus 20 verses 7 and 8. So the Lord is declaring clearly, lest there be any doubt in anybody's mind, it is the Lord who sanctifies you. Let me give you a second witness, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. This is Psalm 37, verses 5 and 6. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Hallelujah. Let me read that again. I love this. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Amen. Number four, the bad news. We have to be prepared to suffer. Sorry. It's not politically correct or very polite to talk about this in good company, but we have to be prepared to suffer. That's just the way it is. The good news is that God promises that at the outcome of the suffering, we will have become his holy saints. Let's look at the example of Jesus. The Lord Jesus is our role model. Listen to what it says in Hebrews 5 verses 8 and 9. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, the King James says, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. This is confirming what we said earlier about obedience, right? He learned obedience by the things that he suffered, but he needed to suffer in order to learn that perfect obedience and, and to have total dependence upon the Father and do only his will. The book of Daniel, which is a book that was written for us of the last generation, declares, Many shall be purified, made white, and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. That's Daniel 12, verse 10. Many shall be purified, made white, and refined. But the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. We'll be purified in the furnace of affliction. Let me give you a second witness in Isaiah 48, verse 10. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. So, this is another illustration of why it's so dangerous to believe in the secret rapture. The belief that the church is going to get whisked off um, in, by, you know, in, a, in a secret visitation by the Lord Jesus Christ where he will take his elect, rapture them to heaven, and then there will be tribulation on earth seven years until his definitive second coming. All of that is a false teaching. The church will not be whisked away the church is going to be here on earth for the tribulation. All of us need to be prepared. We need to be trained. We need to be um, have our swords sharpened through study of the word. We need to be fervent and diligent in prayer, earnest in prayer. And we need to be you know, fasting, afflicting ourselves and preparing because the time of trouble that's coming is going to be like a huge tsunami that's going to just roll over us. And when it comes... If you have not prepared, if you have not built up that character before the tsunami hits, you're going to drown. There's no question about it. You're going you're gonna to make wrong choices. You will allow the persecution to intimidate you. You will, uh, you will fall. You will fall. If you're uh, 
if your house, if your spiritual house is not built on the solid rock of the Word of God, you will be swept away, guaranteed. So now is the time to prepare. Now is the time to build that character, and that character is built through suffering, through prayer, through diligent uh, seeking of the Lord, uh, through study of the Word, through fasting, through uh, congregating with uh, like-minded believers, worshiping God in spirit and in truth. These are all of the things, all of the things that will prepare us to uh, face the time of trouble. Now there's one more scripture on the role that suffering plays in this process. And because this is such an um, a counterintuitive aspect of Christianity, I want to give you this scripture, even though we're running a little bit short on time here. Let me give you this scripture anyway, because people think they're just going to waltz into heaven. No, it's not going to happen. You're going to have to suffer. You're going to have to fight for it. Um, it, it there's going to be a price to pay for heaven. Let's read from Romans 8, verses 16 and 17. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Hallelujah. And if children than heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Now that's a conditional if. Did you hear that? Okay, let's read that again quickly. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. In other words, our eternal inheritance is contingent upon our willingness to suffer for Jesus like he suffered for us. Now, he will never ask us to suffer as much for him as he suffered for us, but he certainly is going to ask us to carry our cross and follow him. Our identity is in Christ. We need to be willing to pick up that cross so that we may be glorified with him and sit on his throne like he sat on his father's throne. There are no shortcuts, no free tickets. But when we get to heaven and we see the glory of heaven and the glory of the father, let me tell you, we shall surely say, no matter the cost, heaven was cheap enough. What assistance is provided to those seeking holiness? The good news is that we're not on our own. All of the resources of heaven are at our disposal. But let's be more specific. One of the key resources that God has given us is his word. Let me read this passage to you from Ephesians 5, verses 25 through 27. Husbands, now, this is not about marriage or about um, relationships. This is about how Jesus sanctifies the church and cleanses the, ch the church with the washing of water by the word. But remember that in the Bible, churches are symbolized by women. And in this passage, uh, the Lord is talking about the church as he would refer to a bride or to a wife. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Again, that's Ephesians 5. The word makes it very clear that the key agent working for our sanctification is the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is the same spirit that inspired the word of God. So, to say that we are sanctified by the word and to say that we are sanctified by the spirit, in fact, we're saying the same thing. Let's read another couple of verses here. But you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Then we get confirmation of this in Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you, I claim this often, I, very often, this renewing and regeneration 
by the Holy Spirit. So let's let's read that one again, Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So again, there's a perfect connection between the word of God and the spirit of God, since it's the spirit of God that inspired the word of God. So it's the same agent working, and that is the Holy Spirit. Now, God doesn't do anything to us without our active consent and our active participation. We said earlier we need to be co-laborers with him in the sanctification process. So let's talk about our part in the sanctification process. We're not meant to be passive bystanders or casual observers. We have to be fully invested in the sanctification process because it takes time and it takes work. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. So we need to guard the avenues of our soul, which are the five senses. We need to be very vigilant about what we watch, what we listen to, what we eat and drink, where we go, and even what we allow our minds to dwell. Even that is very important for the sanctification process. You're listening to Setting the Record Straight, God's Truth for This Generation. What will give us the victory is our focus on Jesus to the exclusion of everything else. That is the victory. Faith is the victory. The vision of Jesus is what we need to become. Let's read this beautiful passage. Let me give you this other beautiful scripture, which I love. Again, another one that I claim often. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. I'm sure you know that one. That's in 2 Corinthians 3.18. I love it. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So again, the Spirit of the Lord is um, highlighted here as being the key agency through which sanctification takes place. Now, the glory of the Lord that is referred to in this passage when it says we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, that glory, that glory of the Lord is his character. We read about that in Exodus 34 uh, when, when Moses asks the Lord to show him his glory and the Lord um, says, you cannot see my face, you, you'll just see my back. And then the Lord uh, proclaims his name and then proclaims the characteristics of his character. Mercy, long-suffering, patient, merciful especially. And, um, and uh, describes, essentially describes his character for Moses. So the glory of God is his character. His character is so spotless, so pure, so holy, so without blemish that the glory of the Lord will consume any sinner who is not um, in the same in the same state of perfection as the Lord. Any any um, evil agent, any uh, wicked person will be consumed by the glory of the Lord. And we, in fact, unless we are sanctified, we will not be able to be glorified uh, to be as the Lord. There is a biblical principle that this is built upon, which says that as we behold, we become changed. That's the biblical principle operating behind that scripture in 2 Corinthians 3.18. So as we behold, we become changed, we become transformed from glory to glory. Keep your eyes on Jesus, our high priest. Ask him to impart to you his perfect character and his perfect obedience, his perfect love, his perfect mercy, his perfect humility. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So that is a beautiful promise in Hebrews 10, 14. For by one offering, when he died on the cross, one time he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Meaning us, those of us who are invested, engaged, actively engaged, pursuing holiness, pursuing sanctification, that we may be glorified. He has already perfected us we just need to believe it, claim it, and receive it in Jesus' name. So to recap, God does his part, and we do our part in the sanctification process. We are partners. Our part is to surrender to him daily, 
to keep our eyes on Jesus, our high priest, and to guard the avenues of our soul. God, through the Holy Spirit, will do the rest. Sanctified for what purpose? We said earlier that sanctification is the restoration of God's image and likeness in us. For what purpose? One purpose is to perform good works. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's in Ephesians 2.10. So look, look how beautiful our Heavenly Father is that before we were even born, he knew us. He already created us in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So according to our talents and abilities, he has already defined what are the works that he, was, he would have us walk in, and then he has prepared us accordingly. That is just amazing. It's beautiful. But there's more. God imputed our sins to Jesus and imputed his righteousness to us. This is Christ's ministry of reconciliation. So there's one particular good work that we are all intended to walk in, and that is that we are to co-labor with Jesus in that ministry of reconciliation. Let's read that passage in 2 Corinthians 5. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation, that is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. That's 2 Corinthians 5, verses 17 through 20. So we are to share the good news. We are to share the gospel. The good news of the gospel is that if we believe in Christ, if we accept his perfect sacrifice, our transgressions, our iniquities, our sins are not imputed to us, but they are imputed to Christ and his righteousness is imputed to us. So this is the beautiful message of salvation that we are to share. So reconciliation is Christ's ministry. He's performing that ministry right now in the most holy place. And he has committed this ministry to us as well. So we're to co-labor with our high priest to reconcile many to the Father. This is nothing more and nothing less than the go ye therefore of Matthew 28, 19. That's the go ye therefore. Jesus wants us to bear much fruit and be his disciples. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. That's John 15, verse 8. Now there's an end time dimension of this charge that Jesus gave his disciples. For so the Lord has commanded us. I'm reading now from Acts 13, verse 47. For so the Lord has commanded us. I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. Which light to the Gentiles? Not just any light, but the light of the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, the end time gospel, which is the eternal gospel, the everlasting gospel. But it has a particular nuance at the end of time, and we have to be ambassadors for that message. So again, what is that message of Revelation 14? The first angel's message, and this, by the way, is going to be in Revelation 14, verses 6 through 12. The first angel's message is, Worship the Creator, for the hour of judgment is come. Not will come, has come, is come. The second message, the second angel's message, is Babylon is fallen. And the third angel's message is a dire warning to those who would take the mark of the beast. So this is the end time message. This is the last message from God to the world. We are sanctified so that we may take this message to the world with power and authority in the spirit of Elijah. The Closing Evidence The great controversy has raged ever since Lucifer rebelled in heaven, and it will soon come to its resolution with the final triumph of Christ as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Now there's something you may not have picked up on in this conflict. 
God is on trial. This is clearly seen in the book of Job. And if you haven't um, listened to my study called The Battle is Real, you must listen to that study because part of what I explain there is the fact that God is on trial before the universe. Now let's get a second witness in Romans 3, 4, which says, Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. Now this is speaking to God, about God. That you may be justified in your words. Let me, sorry, let me start again. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. So clearly God is being judged. Why is God on trial? Satan accused God before all the host of heaven of imposing an unjust government. He claimed that God's law is arbitrary and that it's not only impossible to keep God's law, but he claims that it's also unnecessary to keep God's law. Now, God could have immediately destroyed Satan, zapped him in a moment. He didn't do that. Instead, he chose to allow Satan's mode of government to play itself out here on earth. It had to unfold on a limited scale in the view of the entire universe. So it was contained to this planet. Remember when uh, Satan was cast out of heaven, he landed on this planet. That's why it says in Revelation 12, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea because the, the devil has come down to them with great wrath. So the damage was contained to this planet, and in this way, the citizens of heaven and the citizens of the unfallen world, worlds rather, could see for themselves what would happen if Satan were in control of the entire universe. So this was a sampling of Satan's government. And look where we are. Look at the chaos, the destruction, the hopelessness, the despair, the poverty, the lack, and, um, and no hope, right? We have nothing to look forward to but destruction. God's faithful people, his elect, which the book of Revelation talks about a lot in Revelation 12, Revelation 14, and other passages. God's faithful people, therefore, are the closing evidence in God's trial. We are to be holy and obedient because we need to demonstrate to the watching universe that God's law can be kept in the power of his spirit, we can't do it on our own. We cannot, in our own strength, keep the law of God. We need to keep the Ten Commandments by the power of God's Holy Spirit. And we also need to demonstrate to the watching universe that we obey God because we love him. Not because he coerces us. In God's world, there is no coercion. There is only liberty. We obey him because we love him. And therefore, and by so doing, we are witnesses to God's perfect character and to his justice. The world as we know it will soon come to an end. And 1,000 years after the destruction of the world, at the end of the millennium, which is that period of 1,000 years, God will resurrect the wicked for their hour of judgment. This is called in the Bible the second resurrection. The wicked will see their lives. They will see all of the opportunities for mercy that they rejected. And every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's Philippians 2, verses 10 and 11. So this hour of judgment will come when the wicked will be judged, because remember, the righteous are raised up in the first resurrection, which happens at the coming of Christ. Those of us who are alive, and I pray and I hope, that I will be among those who will be able to stand and endure until the very end, until Jesus comes. Those who are dead in Christ at that time will be raised up. That's the first resurrection. So those who are translated and those who are resurrected all rise up in the air to meet the Lord Jesus. And a thousand years after that will be the millennium. And at the end of the millennium, the new Jerusalem comes down, adorned as a bride, with all manner of beautiful jewels on her. This is the holy city, the new Jerusalem. And at that time, the Lord 
will raise up all the wicked. They're going to rebel one more time. They're going to actually turn against Satan and destroy him. And their judgment will be pronounced at that time. Then the earth will become a ball of fire. And uh, that's, that's what the lake of fire is. It's when the, the earth burns up. It collapses upon itself, burns up. All the wicked are destroyed. And God will have resolved the problem of sin in the universe. So all of us who have sinned, uh, but who have claimed Jesus, our sins will have been blotted out from the heavenly sanctuary. That's why we are uh, taken to heaven with the Lord Jesus. And those whose sins are not covered by the blood of the Lamb, their sins fall back upon their own heads, and they will have to pay with their lives for their sins. You're listening to Setting the Record Straight, God's Truth for This Generation. That's what awaits both the righteous and the wicked. And Philippians 2, verse 10 and 11, which I just read, is explaining that at the moment of the, the judgment of the wicked, they will see all the opportunities for mercy that they rejected. They will see how God, time and again through the Holy Spirit, tried reaching out to them, but they hardened their hearts. Um, they did not listen. They did not receive Christ. And therefore, they will have to admit that God is just. And this is why the Bible says, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of, of God the Father. And the entire universe will at that time be in agreement. Everyone will be in agreement. The holy angels will be in agreement. The Godhead, obviously, in agreement. Um, the the um, citizens of the unfallen worlds will also be in agreement, as well as all mankind, both the righteous and the wicked, which will have been resurrected, as I said. Everyone, the entire universe will be in agreement that God's mode of government is perfect and fair. He was just, he was merciful, and those who rejected his mercy, sadly, will have to suffer the consequences for that. So we have another confirmation in Revelation sixteen seven, where the Bible says, And I heard another angel from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. So this will be the consensus in the entire universe. There will be no doubt in anybody's mind that God is a just God, that his character and his government are perfect, and that Satan was the one who was wrong and whose mode of government would have led the entire universe to nothing but chaos and destruction as it did on earth and everybody will have seen the result on earth as it played itself out that leaves for us a very 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 big responsibility that we are God's witnesses and we need to be prepared to do whatever it takes to vindicate his character before the entire universe this is why we read in 1 Peter 2.9, this very famous verse, which I'm sure you know. It says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And we will bear witness that the mercy of God and the justice of God work together to save all those who are willing to be saved. The plan of redemption, the plan of salvation, is a perfect plan. It is a loving plan. It is a just plan. It is a righteous plan. It is a merciful plan. And so if we come into alignment with the God of the universe, if we come into alignment with His Son and the Holy Spirit, and we accept, we accept the perfect redemption that is offered in Christ, we will be saved, and we will experience both the justice and the mercy of God. I'd like to close with this beautiful promise in the book of Daniel, Daniel 12, verse 3. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation.
And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Thank you for listening to Setting the Record Straight, God's truth for this generation. If you've been blessed by this program, we encourage you to share it with others. To ask any question related to this Bible study or any other spiritual matter, email us at info at citybiblegroup.com. To find out more, visit our website at citybiblegroup.com. Hi, I'm Marla Ilana. Thank you so much for studying God's Word with me. Please click on the subscribe button below and you'll be blessed with many more powerful truths for our generation. Jesus is coming soon. Are you ready?